Yeah, I mean, you look at artists like uh, Leonardo da Vinci and uh, his great dream was for humanity to fly. Uh, he did all these drawings of flying machines, feathered creatures, and then we have the Wright brothers, and now in Syria we've got bombers. Picasso did his uh, Guernica about bombing in 1935 in Spain, the beginning of World War II. We've got bombers actually bombing the refugees who've tried to escape from uh, the conflicts throughout Syria, and uh, they're in tents and they're bombing them. So what are we? I mean, it's like rogue apes, uh, humans, for us, for Helen and I, it's, it's, it, we're, we're having a war on war itself. And uh, for me, there's uh, one of my early drawings, um, I think it was about 12 when I did that, Rockdale Book, Book Week Prize or something. Um, we, we're all watching the James Dean movies, you know, and there's the one uh, Rebel Without a Cause where... Uh, they, they steal cars and go to a cliff and one boy goes over the cliff because his clothes get caught in the car and we thought this is pretty good. So we got uh, a bunch of billy carts and rode down towards a cliff and uh, the kid next to me just wouldn't give up. And so I went right over and uh, when I went to St George Hospital the doctor said, George you're one chop short of a barbie, you know like... Uh, the fear problem, but I think um, the thing with me and fear is that I'm a mystic and um, I've always had a sense of the other side and this knowledge of um, what's beyond the material world has, has let me go into many of these war zones. There I am in um, our yellow house in Jalalabad. We, uh, <coughs> I just had my puppet there. It all started for me with puppets. Um, I was a kid growing in Rockdale. There are only two Australian board kids in the street. The rest were migrants from World War II. And I decided to do puppet shows. It was before television. I'm ancient. And uh, we had all these little puppets. And Dad came home and uh, started taking collections. He didn't know what to do with the money, so he gave it to the Red Cross. And suddenly I was a phenomenon. They had me doing puppet shows all over the countryside, uh, in churches, school halls. And um, one parent got the idea that it, they'd help me. Tape recorders had just been invented. And um, so they put all my voices. I had lots of funny little voices. And uh, suddenly I had the ogre talking as the princess and the king talking as the clown. And the audience got very restless. So, um, but however, the Red Cross came along and um, they... Uh, uh, told me what, what was happening with my money, and that gave me a tremendous sense of fulfilment. Then we did the Yellow House in King's Cross, and the first thing that I wanted to do, I was there with Martin Sharp and Brett Whiteley, was create a puppet theatre. And um, this is the beautiful background, and I was inspired by Islamic art. I went to Kingsgrove North High School, and I remember going at the headmaster and saying, I want to study Islamic art as part of my high school certificate. And he said, oh, there's no textbooks. So if you get six other kids, you might be able to do it. And I got six other kids. And now Kings Road North is next to Lakemba Mosque, and I was the one that got Islamic art studies started. So this is um, our original yellow house. And uh, great Martin Sharp, Richard Neville, Oz Magazine. Uh, boy, you know, that was, they all saw jail doing that work. That was the Carnival of the Bold. And there I am as a... It's gone, but there I am as a... Uh, that night I'd done The Little Prince, there's Johnny Lewis, and on the way home I wiped my makeup off because I couldn't find makeup remover, and I was, my taxi broke down. I was driving a taxi to help run the yellow house, and girls went past. They'd just been watching the movies. Ah! You know, that looked like sort of the monster from the Black Lagoon was walking up Irwood Hill. I don't think um, John Howard's family were running the petrol station that night, but they didn't charge me for my can of fuel. And uh, anyway, <coughs> there's the stone room. The yellow house for us was, I've never taken drugs, I've never even smoked a joint. And uh, for us, it was bringing all that we'd learnt, you know, I'd studied in America, known Andy Warhol, worked with the civil rights movement before I did the yellow house. And it was bringing art to Sydney. It was a very dead place. It was as, as corrupt as it is now. It had Axon, it did, a Aston, it didn't have Baird, but they looked very alike to me. And um, the, uh, 
So uh, just hold on that one for a second. So the last night, Martin and I at the Yellow House, we, we'd been invaded by hippies. Um, these people, they thought that if you wore uh, beads and uh, tie-dye clothes, then that was fine art. You could take an LSD trip in a storm water drain or a bus terminal. It was as good as going and seeing an exhibition of Matisse or Picasso. And uh, we, I, Martin and I walked down one night. My mother had made a beautiful ceramic uh, light holder and um, a hippie banged his head on it and then smashed it to pieces. Just He was tripping. All right, so switching mics. I mess everything up, I'm sorry. Did you see that picture earlier of me, my mother horrified when I was a baby on the bike? You know, poor old mum. When she was dying, she said, you know, George, it all worked out. It all worked out. And I think she'd had a lot of doubts for a long time. <laughs> she, she lived to 96, you know. But um, so... Uh, the, the guru of the Yellow House then wasn't Martin Sharp or Brett Whiteley or anyone else, it was Fred Robinson who had a uh, flying saucer cult and he believed Jesus was going to come back to the world and convert everyone and um, we're all going to be Christians and it was all going to be different. So uh, I did an odd sort of a thing. I, I, I wrote to uh, Mother Teresa in Calcutta. Malcolm Muggeridge, Muggeridge has just discovered her. And I said, what should I do? Should I um, go back and retrain? I loved the days when I did the Red Cross puppet shows for people. She wrote back and said, if you use the gifts that God gave you and you use them for other people, you'll be fulfilled. You'll be a happy person. And then she told me to pray for her. And I've actually followed Mother... Tr I'm not a Christian, but I followed Mother Teresa's advice. And I'm a very happy 66-year-old. So God bless you, Mother Teresa. She said, pray for me. <laughs> And uh, she made a big difference. Um, we'll move on. So there's our new yellow house and there's the old Sufi. And uh, the one thing that I have known and loved all my life are the mystics of Sufism. One of the sad things, one of the big problems is, particularly in Australia in the media, people are calling IS and these terrorists that are killing people Muslims. They're not Muslims. They're Wahhabis. This religion was invented by the Saudis. And they've spent billions of dollars... Uh, promoting this hate religion around the world. It hates women, it hates art, and it hates culture. I'd like news networks around the world to stop calling it Islam. They've got to call it Wahhabism. And uh, most of all, they hate Sufis. And there's our lovely Sufi in the middle. <laughs> Keep going. So this is Nicaragua, 1986. I'm only being a macho man. I never used a gun. I'm just posing with one. That was our... Uh, first um, film where all my movies have shown how creative people can uh, make more of a dif difference than, than others. All the film soundtrack to War, Bullets of Poets, have been about how in the face of war um, you, can, you can do creative work. And that's probably, to me, it's more important than my paintings, my films or anything else, just to create in the face of these people who are destroying. And uh, with our Yellow House in Jalalabad, you know, it cost a, a million dollars a year for every single soldier that was in uh, Afghanistan. Every Australian soldier cost taxpayers a million dollars a year. Our Yellow House has been funded entirely from the sale of my art. Uh, all the work that those soldiers did in Tarankau is gone. The, the schools they built are gone. They just killed a lot of people, got a lot of Australian soldiers killed. You might have seen the TV show the other night where they had a soldier who went into a home and it said, oh, there was a fighting age man in there and he had a gun. So we threw hand grenades inside and killed his whole family and him as well. Well, I mean, what? Uh, what if you did that in America? Everyone's got a gun in America and any man who's got a family is fighting age, you know? Uh, what were we doing there? What did we achieve in Afghanistan? Very little. But our yellow house is still going and it's, we're creating great things. The thing that changed my life, that's Cabello in Rwanda. There's couple hundred thousand people alive on the left and on the right, they're all dead. I lived, lived through that massacre of four days. Let's keep going. And there's Immaculate. And she's more than Mother Teresa. She's the woman or the young girl that really changed my life. Um, when, when you're in, in the middle of a massacre, um, you've just got to try and help people. I collected babies and got them to orphanages and things like that. It seems like you're a vulture to sit down and take photographs or do a drawing. 
And the doctor was there, saw I was exhausted. And I said, uh, I, I, you know, can I help this young lady? And she said she's going to die because she'd had her head chopped and in that filth she would die. She said, just sit with her. And as I sat with her, she said, uh, why are you drawing me? And I said, because I want the world to see what you've done, what's, what, what, because I want the world to see what's been done to you. And so she kept alive. She maintained, I saw her life, her light, inner light flickering in and out, but she stayed alive long enough uh, to do that drawing. And um, as you can see, I've painted her and painted her. She's on the covers of books and she's my eyewitness. She's the innocent victim of this kind of insanity. And there's, uh, we'll keep going. So that's Rwanda. And what I learnt was I bought my work back, a you know, the art, in you won't find a George Giddos in the art gallery of New South Wales. School kids study it, but the art world hates it because it's not decorative. And uh, there's my preacher. Um, and uh, the thing is that this is art that speaks about how much Australians care about the outside world. If you go to anywhere in the world, you'll find uh, Australians working for the Red Cross Medicine Sans Frontiers, um, and we do care. And so, you know, John Olson can paint his landscapes, uh, you can paint, you can do Ned Kelly, but my stuff's about how much we care. And yet, I've realised it makes very little difference to the politicians. And this is my big um, Soxenhausen painting. And I did that in the 50th anniversary of the UN. And it's about the most evil place on earth, which is Soxenhausen. And uh, it's where they, Hitler first started killing people. And they did human experiments there and finally became the, uh, the place where the SS were trained. And they went out and they ran all the other concentration camps. And I wonder, you know, the UN's been formed where so much, so many decades, you know, more than half a century beyond the, when that happened, and I'm still seeing this in all the places where I work. Oh, that's, yeah. So this is, uh, my next film's going to be a sequel to um, Rampage. This is my film Rampage. One of the soldiers, one of the black soldiers in Iraq said to me, Elliot Lovett said, George, it's more dangerous in, Baghdad, in uh, Miami, where I come from, than in Baghdad. And so we're doing that again because nothing changed under Obama. Let's keep going. There's Eminem. And now Helen and I are the producers of more Pashtun movies. You know, we realise that the way to reach people, uh, women, women on, in Afghanistan and Pakistan are not allowed to go to video stores or go to the movies. So uh, we make these movies and here's, here I am, George Giddo's films and these are available everywhere. And our latest thing is that we use uh, ice cream boys who sell ice creams so that they can uh, sell movies over the fence. It's like the Trojan horse. And our movies have got uh, female stars. That's our circus. We take the... In fact, you know, imagine when I walk up to people and they say, what do you do? And I say, I've got a circus in Afghanistan. <laughs> and I train monkeys. So I'm this old man that walks into a village with a monkey and all the kids come up and the Taliban want to stop us and the kids are loving my little monkey so much that uh, finally the Taliban go off and get their grandkids as well and the monkey takes them all into the tent and by the end of the day we've won them all over. And there's the old Sufi. Um, so yeah, and I, I've got, I do a bit of kind of voodoo magic like we get death threats every day there, so every now and again I do a, a comedy where I get my head cut off and I do the video myself. I don't wait for IS to do it. And there's Niha, she's a hero with Hel Helen and they both do the women's workshops at the Ella House. Uh, let's go quickly. Keep going, bang, 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 bang. That's our latest film, Snow Monkey. And there's Shazia. And our latest movie, all of our movies are love stories. And Helen and I are a great love story too. It's a very romantic story. And there's the old Sufi. So the saddest thing was we had to come back to Australia for a minute. And while we were there, the old Sufi uh, was killed. He had his tongue cut out by IS and his head, head removed from his body. And um, that's the Yellow House thing. And that, that was, let's just speed it through. That's one of the paintings I sold to get the money to run the Yellow House. 
that's doing video clips. So the, here's the, the kids. The ice cream boys finally took over the circus and they're now making their own movies. And to me, that's conceptual art. There they are. They've made their movie and there I am with the beautiful old Sufi. So, so the saddest day of my life was, um, it was a rotten day and, and there'd been a bombing in the Kabul bank and we went down, there were dead bodies everywhere and um, the people I'd gotten to come and um, be, be interviewed for my film were too frightened to come. I started appearing like spiders in the corners of buildings. And so I went down to the park and I went to a little cafe of a friend and there was a gypsy woman there, a coochie woman, and I just knew she was trying to speak to me, but women are not allowed into the cafes. And finally she plucked her courage and she came in and a shiver went down my back. And uh, she, she had the news that the old Sufi had been killed. I just didn't know what to do. I've got a, a drone and uh, I thought, we, the Sufi and I used to go down to the Kabul River and watch the, uh, the eagles together. That I'll take my drone down there and uh, fly it with the eagles, and that'll be like the spirit of the Sufi. But when I got down to the river, hunters were there and they'd killed all the eagles. So it was a really bad day. And a little kid came over with a bird in his hand, and he led me out onto the, here, no, go back, onto the riverbed. And there it is, I call this the Eye of God. So Taliban and ISIS, they used to be the oldest caves of Buddhist art in the world along the river bank, much older than Bamiyan, a thousand years older than Bamiyan. It's where the actual skull of, uh, of the Buddha was kept as a, as a relic. And they smashed them all and pushed them to the river. And here it was, this eye looking up from the rocks. It was like the old Sufi had reached, reached me through time and space. There it is. Um, now, can we keep moving? So, the greatest day of my life, that's my billboard for the Peace Prize. Next one. The happiest day of my life was going to Cabramatta High School and the kids there all celebrate, not the Peace Prize itself, the next day. And uh, two little Syrian girls came up with a, a dub in their hands and um, they are refugees, recently arrived. The 14 schools there. The teachers there are doing such a wonderful job. I'd like to uh, chain people like Tony Abbott to one of the school polls and make them watch what's being achieved there. And uh, and I got. I mean, look. I will, as long as I live, I'll never treasure a moment as much as this. As feeling this little dove's hands beating in my uh, heart, beating in my hands, and these two little girls clasping their hands over mine. And then it was like a scene out of a movie. Uh, the doves spiral, spiraled around above us. And um, it's very important to me tonight to have Helen here because Helen is the bravest part of the Yellow House because the, only, the thing that's brought us all of our death threats is the workshops that we give for women. And she's teaching women who are starting their own radio shows, going on television, bring, bring about real change in Afghanistan, not, not at the point of gun, but through their own message. So here's Helen, and we're lucky tonight. She's going to sing you the... She was the first woman to uh, sing on um, national television that uh, women have been banned from singing in, in Afghanistan. And she sang this song, which is like the, um, oh, you know, the waltzing Matilda of our province. And uh, people loved her for it because they were nationalistic and they forgot that she was a woman. But the bravest person I know, Helen Rose. Well, you can have your gods, you can have anything you want, but for me... Music unites us all. I couldn't speak the Pashto language. I arrived there, I met the musicians first because I'm a singer, and suddenly we were connected, you know. So I'm going to sing the song for you now. You won't understand the words at the beginning, but you will feel something. And that's what life is about, feeling and love. <laughs>
Jerusalem.